So welcome. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional unceded territory of the Quetzalcoatl First Nation and welcome um, all of our guests this evening into our joint council meeting. It's good to see some of you. Um, not, all of, not all of us are here tonight, but it's good to see the ones that are and look forward to having some kind of connection and look even more forward to seeing each other in person again one day. And so before we begin in this room, we'd like to acknowledge that we have different views. We have different ways of expression, different emotional intensities and different roads that lead to conclusions. May we combine clarity of mind with kindness of heart and may we be impartial without bending to strong personalities. May we sacrifice self-interest for the good of the whole and may we do our work with love and clarity of vision for the benefit of those that we represent. And on that note, I'll call the meeting to order and welcome everyone. We're still on Zoom, obviously. And we'll start with introductions. So Mayor Sebring, I'm going to ask you to introduce your council and staff, and then we will introduce ours. Thank you very much, Mayor Staples. Uh, thank you very much for hosting this meeting. Uh, to those who are tuning in and aren't familiar with this process, we as the two councils try to meet jointly a couple of times a year, we have a protocol for that. And uh, we alternate hosting duties and the city of Duncan is doing the hosting duties this time. Thank you for that. Uh, this is being hosted on their platform for North Cowichan folks. The video will eventually also show up on our website, but it's being live streamed through the, the Duncan uh, facilities for now. Um, this is a concurrent meeting of the two councils. So if you're not a process person, you're gonna be a little bit confused because Mayor Staples will call a question on a particular um, motion. And then I will call the same question on a particular motion for my council so that we're all moving forward in lockstep. That way, if there are amendments or things like that, uh, that proceed in the course of the discussions, we can uh, consider all those together. With that, I'll uh, do some quick introductions and I'd like to ask the uh, staff from North Couch and to also turn their cameras on so I can introduce them. Uh, from council, we have uh, councillors uh, Christopher Justice, Tech Manhas, Rosalie Sari, Deborah Toporowski, and Rob Douglas. Councillor Marsh Center regrets this evening she had a previous commitment. Uh, from staff, I'm just looking down the, the list here. We have Don Stewart from Parks and Rec, Clay Ritzman from the Engineering Department, Rob Conway from Planning, David Conway, the Director of Engineering, Barb Floden is our uh, Communication Specialist Trish Maya is our Deputy Corporate Officer. And I think that's, oh, that's it for our staff, except for uh, our Chief Administrative Officer, of course, Ted Swaby. So welcome to staff as well. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to do the introductions. Mayor Staples. Thank you so much. And thank you for explaining how things work in this joint meeting format. That's much appreciated. So I'm going to introduce um, our council from the city of Duncan and we have Councillor Bruce with us this evening. Uh, Councillor Brooke is here this evening. Councillor Duncan is all the way here from Mexico. Uh, Councillor Caps is here. Councillor Newington is here. And I believe that is all of our council present. And in terms of our staff this evening, we have um, our CAO, Peter Diverti is here. If I can get the rest of the staff to turn on their cameras. I see Brian Murphy from Engineering. Welcome. Um, Monica Sh um, Shittick is here and she is our Corporate Officer. Alison Boyd is here. And she, <laughs> I, I just can't remember her name, but Alison pretty much does almost everything at the city. <laughs> And um, that is everyone I believe that I see on the screen. Um, so I, I, I forgot somebody, George Farkas, uh, acting general manager, acting deputy CAO. I'm not sure if he had his camera. Maybe that's why I missed him. But George, welcome as well. Okay, Allison, can you explain what your title is to me too, so that I can remember? Because for some reason, it's I'm gapping on it this evening. Uh, corporate services coordinator. That's right, corporate services coordinator. You think that after all these years. <laughs> um, okay. I would have all the acronyms in place. I know what everyone does at the city to a, a certain extent, but uh, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, 
Ted, do you, did you have your hand up or were you just waving to say hello? Okay, you're good. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we will begin. We're going to call the meeting to order. And so I will start by calling the meeting to order. And um, I think that Mayor Sebring has done a good explanation of what happens tonight. And we're obviously still on Zoom uh, using a video platform. This will be part of the city's public record. And as Mayor Sebring said, it will also become part of our couch and uh, public record and streamed on YouTube, which will be available for your viewing pleasure at any time in the future, should you wish to watch this meeting. Uh, by searching the city of Duncan on our end, and I would imagine North Couch and on yours. So, um, Mayor Sebring, is there anything you'd like to add to calling the meeting to order? Nope, I'd like to call our meeting to order as well at the same time. I think we have uh, approval of agenda motions, and uh, as the host, yes, we do. First. And so, I'd like to call that the September 20th, 2021 Council agenda, the joint meeting between the city of Duncan and the municipality of North Couch, and be approved as circulated. I have a mover and a seconder for my council. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Over to you, Mayor Sebring. Thank you, Mayor Staples. Same motion here. We need a motion to approve the agenda as circulated from North Cowichan Council. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And opposed? That carries. And we'll move over to the adoption of the minutes. The last time we met was quite a while ago, January 21st, 2021. I'd like to call that we adopt the Joint Council Committee of the Whole Minutes as circulated. I see a mover and a seconder from our council. Any questions, concerns? Hearing none, all those in favor? Motion carries. Over to you, Mayor Sebring. Thank you. Same motion from North Carriage Council. Adoption of the minutes of the uh, January 21st Joint Committee of the Whole meeting. And I have a motion. Moved, seconded by Councillor Manhas. All in favor? And opposed? That carries. Mayor Stavis. All right. Thank you. And I'm going to invite our delegation in. But before I do that, I'm just going to call out to um, just uh, the City of Duncan Council for approval that we extend the delegation time allotment um, for North Couch and Master Transportation Plan presentation. A mover and a seconder I see. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries, thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Nadine King from the Watt Consulting Group to present the North Couch and Master Transportation Plan and a reminder that once the PowerPoint goes up, that uh, we will hold questions until the end. And we, if everyone can turn off their cameras uh, as well, that would be great. Um, Ted, is that your hand? Are you? Are you yes, yes okay. sorry, Mayor Staples. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. uh, I was going to ask that uh, David Conway just introduce her. Uh, our Absolutely. Presenter. And then that just a, a heads up that uh, after the presentation, uh, David Conway has one slide he's going to try and share just to generate some um, issues that uh, between the two municipalities for us to think about. I just want to give that heads up. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Mr. Swaby. So where are you on the screen here? I don't see you. Oh, there you are, David. Okay. If you want to introduce, please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Staples. Um, good evening, Council, uh, City of Duncan and North Cowichan. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Nadine King from Watt Consulting. Uh, based in Victoria, uh, who have been working diligently on uh, Municipality of North Cowichan's Master Transportation Plan. It's a refresh of a plan that was originally prepared uh, around 2000. And since then, a lot of things have happened in the realm of transportation needs and desires of our communities. And uh, Watt uh, have worked uh, not only with uh, engagement of the community uh, through MODIS, uh, but also their own efforts to get a background report card on where we are. And that's the primary uh, thrust of the presentation this evening. And uh, I hope that uh, we bring out a lot of discussion about how the two communities and the other communities are, that are not only connected to North Cowichan and the city of Duncan, but also 
uh, take advantage of the many services available. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll let Nadine take over the presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Nadine. Thank you. Um, are you putting up the presentation or am I sharing my screen? Miss Boyd? Uh, it's a share screen enabled. Perfect. Thank you. Um, All right, hopefully you can see the presentation. <laughs> um, I will turn my camera off as well to save some uh, bandwidth as well. Um, once I figure out how to do that. Um, or maybe I won't, I'll just jump in to save time. Uh, yes, thank you both mayors and both councils for uh, giving us this opportunity to present uh, where we are so far uh, with the transportation master plan for North Cowichan and engage with uh, urban systems as well as both councils uh, to create a joint, uh, a cohesive uh, plan for both uh, communities in the end. So uh, just to highlight what we're gonna talk about from our perspective, uh, I'll just briefly touch about on uh, sort of the stages of our plan uh, the results of our phase one uh, part of the project. Uh, I'll have a little bit of an update on uh, where we are in phase two and some direction we're taking and, uh, and then the next steps. Uh, so we have three stages or three phases to our project. The first was to complete the existing conditions, background and framework for the transportation master plan. Um, really just getting a deep understanding of North Cowichan and what are the current practices and where would you know, people in the community like to go? Um, we are currently in the middle of assessing the network um, and planning out uh, the network for all transportation users. Um, and then once we have that uh, phase two completed, we will prepare the final, uh, final draft and final plan um, for adoption. Um, the project does have some extensive engagement. Um, a lot of this was done in the first phase. Uh, so we did a public uh, online survey that was completed. Um, we got several hundred, uh, more than several hundred uh, survey respondents. Um, we did uh, informant interviews. So interviewed uh, some key stakeholders uh, in the community. Uh, we have reached out to the various First Nations uh, in the Valley. Um, and that is, we have some ongoing consultations still with uh, various First Nations. Um, we completed a household travel survey uh, for all of North Cowichan. Um, and so this was done by selecting uh, a proportion of the community to send a more detailed survey uh, to, to ask them uh, some detailed questions about their transportation needs to help us better understand where people are going to and from. And, uh, Following this, will there be some more open houses and more engagement uh, and surveys with the community? Um, just to touch a little bit on the travel survey, we uh, got over a thousand responses uh, to the survey. Um, uh, this is the household survey, not the uh, general survey, uh, which exceeded our expectations. Uh, we were only hoping to get 675 to be statistically uh, valid. Um, this is gonna help us understand more about where within the community people are traveling to and, and where they're headed outside of the community, as well as uh, what modes they take. Um, and we've also had a series of questions about how they traveled prior to COVID, during COVID, and where they expect things to be post COVID. Um, so, you know, if they previously drove and then they stayed and worked at home, what is their expectation post COVID that will help us potentially adjust um, the future. Uh, so this is just a bit of a breakdown of the, the different areas uh, that we broke the community into. Um, looking at how people travel today, um, so far we've, we've had the census level data, the travel survey will give us more detailed within each of those sub communities of North Cowichan, but we're a pretty car dominant area, uh, North Cowichan at over 83% of people uh, taking a car. Um, and basically less than 10% using another, another mode. Um, that's quite a bit higher than the provincial average. 
Um, so that's something that we uh, want to work towards uh, improving for North Cowichan. Um, so now I'll touch a little bit on each of the different areas of the transportation network, um, sort of what we know about it in North Cowichan. Um, there's over 136 kilometers of sidewalks, but that only represents about 23% of the road network. Um, so less than a quarter of the road network has some sort of sidewalk. Um, most of those sidewalks are uh, in the residential neighborhoods and are limited um, along any of the major roadways which have the higher traffic volumes. Um, there have been 13 pedestrian collisions across North Cowichan uh, in the last five years. Uh, and some of the things that we'll be working towards in phase two are providing standard uh, policies for crossings, uh, where they're needed and what level of crossing type. Um, and then we'll be working towards creating a network map for uh, the district to you know, upgrade facility types for pedestrians. Uh, those may be paths, they may be sidewalks, um, and we'll be looking at what are the standards for each of those. Um, what we heard from the public around walking uh, was there was a lack of space or separation from cars, there was a general lack of sidewalks, and they didn't like the speed, noise, and fumes of motor vehicles. Um, and what they would like to see is more connections, reduced speeds, and maintaining uh, maintenance of sidewalks. Cycling, um, even less cycling facilities in North Couch and then pedestrian facilities with uh, only 63 kilometers of facilities or less than 10% of the road network. Um, it currently consists of some off-road uh, or pathways, trails, uh, on-road protective facilities, uh, buffered bike lanes, um, and shared lanes. Um, there's limited connectivity of the existing routes and um, some of the facilities don't meet current standards, um, i.e. they're a bit too narrow, there's not enough buffer. Um, and uh, we've had 12 cyclist uh, collisions uh, in the past five years. So similar to the number of pedestrian collisions in five years. Um, we are currently working towards determining uh, the types of bicycle facilities for North Couchin, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, there was a plan done in 2016. We're reviewing that along with the Strata, Strava heat maps um, and knowledge of the community of where people want to get to and from uh, to update uh, and create a new cycling network uh, for North Couchin. Um, that will include new standards for the different types of facilities that we expect. Um, and where within the road network they should be placed. Um, these will also be considered along with both the road classifications and the pedestrian needs in different areas. Um, and lastly, wayfinding is a, a critical point for some uh, cyclists who are unfamiliar, uh, particularly when you get lots of tourists, um, but to help people navigate from uh, the different types of facilities on a bike. What we heard from the community was again, similar to pedestrians, uh, there's a lack of uh, safe infrastructure uh, for where they want to go. Um, also a lack of end user uh, facilities like bike racks uh, and bike parking. Uh, and also similarly, they would like to uh, be away from speed, noise and fumes of motor vehicles. Um, so they'd like more connections, more physical separation and uh, more secure parking in key areas. Um, transit, uh, so transit is uh, basically planned by BC Transit and operated by the CBRD. Um, there are nine routes plus two commuter routes uh, in the region. There's significant coverage across the region, but pretty low frequency on many of the routes. Um, there is a significant number of bus stops at over 230, and but most of them are just a sign pole and uh, occasionally a plastic chair. <laughs> Um, and the ridership is generally low on them. So we saw less than 30 passengers per day, not per hour, per day, on most of the routes. Um, only the hospital and the Couch and Commons uh, shopping center had uh, more passengers per day, and even they were only topping out at around 40 passengers per day. Um, the next busiest areas for transit use in North Cowichan uh, is Shimanus, Crofton, and, and the Berkey's Corner area. Um, this excludes any of the city of Duncan uh, stops. Uh, so things that we'll be considering uh, are how to improve bus stops, uh, make them uh, more user-friendly, uh, more accessible, um, 
and uh, identifying how much density is needed to help uh, add transit service. And a big topic that came out of our survey was education. Um, so what we heard from the barriers was the service isn't frequent enough. It's a lack of direction, a direct routes to where I want to go. So these very long winding routes through the, the region. Um, and then the last one was, I'm not familiar with the transit system. And a lot of those comments were, I don't know how to read the, the transit maps. I don't know how to take the bus. I wouldn't know how to find my stop. Um, so just a general, uh, lack of understanding of, you know, how transit works, which uh, is a pretty big barrier to many people. Um, so what they would like to see, uh, some people wanted to see more service. Some people said, I just would never take transit, um, which is expected. Um, and then they would like to see more routes uh, covering more areas. Uh, so roads, uh, over 600 kilometers of roads in North Cowichan. Uh, most of them are local, which means that they are fairly low volume uh, and, you know, generally service residential neighborhoods. Um, the current standards for North Cowichan for their roads are very dated. They're from the mid 80s um, and they, they are based on mid 80s standards, which had very wide lanes, no bike facilities, limited pedestrian facilities, um, and where they did have them, they were Roads were too wide, sorry. Uh, road standards, uh, yeah, sorry though. Lanes were too wide and the ped facilities were too narrow. Um, the majority of roads in North Cowichan uh, that are their major roads, so that would be your, um, you know, Lakes Road, Maple Bay, Somino's, Drinkwater, um, Cowichan Lake Road are sort of more in the three to 5,000 range, um, but there are, a few that are, you know, well above that uh, per day, going up to about 12,000 vehicles a day. Uh, when we looked at how the peak hours did uh, at the intersection level, um, really we only had two that were uh, having some poor, poor movements, and that was the two roundabouts, one at Salmonos Couch and Lake Sherman Road, and one at the one at Suhalem Maple Bay Road. Uh, when we assessed uh, collision locations, uh, we found that many of the signals and roundabouts were the highest locations, along with the Herd Road, Lakes Road, uh, unsignalized T intersection, the Herd Road, Osborne Bay T intersection, and Canada Avenue and Phillips Street, which is also uh, a T intersection with stop signs. Um, the district does have a truck policy. However, instead of selling trucks where to travel to, uh, or what roads to use, it tells them which roads they can't be on, um, which basically leaves every other road in town up for grabs for trucks. Uh, we also found that there was a pretty substantial speeding issue on many of the roads in North Cowichan, um, and this was greatest on roads with lowest speed limits. Um, and most of this was due to roads, or most of these were on roads that were rural in nature, again, with the really wide lanes, wide shoulders, limited driveways, and low density of land use. So um, very little natural surveillance um, or things going on on the side of the road uh, for drivers. So things we're gonna be working on with the vehicles is a policy for uh, setting posted speed limits, uh, updating those cross sections to, uh, and this shouldn't say to change the nature because we would like to keep the nature of the roads, um, but to change how people behave on the roads. Um, that may include geometric changes. Um, it may include traffic calming, which we are in the process of updating as well. Um, and a review of uh, the OCP land use that is being planned for North Cowichan. Uh, so we got a very split response. And when we asked people about vehicle travel and traffic congestion in North Cowichan, uh, about half the people said there was too much congestion and the other half said, oh, I didn't really have any problems. There's, there's really no vehicle challenges for me. Um, and then a number of people identified that there was some unsafe intersections within North Cowichan. Uh, so what the, from the driver's perspective, what people wanted to see was more physical separation from vehicle and cyclists, uh, more off street parking at key destinations and improved safety at intersections. Um, I'll just touch briefly on the parking that we'll be looking at. So um, there's, as mentioned, uh, 
lack of secure bicycle parking in many places, um, uh, limited guidance on accessible parking. Um, we'll be reviewing the off uh, street parking rates, particularly for multifamily developments. Um, and then looking at on street policies uh, and the bylaw for uh, how on street parking is provided uh, within North Cowichan. Um, so when we asked uh, residents where they wanted us to guide um, transportation uh, decisions for the next 20 plus years, um, pedestrian and cyclists was number one. That was their most important um, issue, followed by maintaining the network, uh, traffic congestion, uh, improving an expanded transit survey, climate change, uh, preparing and making sure uh, new technologies can be accommodated, and then ensuring the affordability of travel for all. So, I think you've sort of heard most of the way through this that pedestrians and cycling are very important. Um, physical separation is important. Uh, speeds and management of speeds are important and uh, maintaining, maintaining the, the road network. So uh, for North Couch and Council, this is a bit of a refined draft vision, but uh, it is still a work in progress uh, for us. Um, but the intent is that North Cowichan will be or is a connected community where residents, employees, businesses and visitors have transportation choices when deciding how to move around their network. Each transportation choice is supported with safe infrastructure and maintains the scenic character of the roadways. North Cowichan travel has become diversified to reduce the impacts on the environment and align with the community's desire to be more sustainable. So that is our goal for or our draft vision for where we see transportation uh, in North Cowichan in 30 years. Um, our goals are to make uh, safe for all um, and a connected network that lets people travel by various means uh, to, and where, to and from where they need to get to and that the transportation network gradually reduces the greenhouse gas uh, impacts over time. So that was sort of the, what do we know about uh, North Cowichan transportation network? Where are we today? Um, so we have started work on phase two, which is the more detailed uh, portion. Um, and where we have sort of started is a combination of bicycle and vehicle network. Um, this is today what North Cowichan's transportation network uh, is classified as. Um, and so our starting point was to look at each of these roads and see, you know, did they make sense still? Um, and uh, really focusing on the blue and yellow roads, which are the arterial and collector roads um, to start with. And what we wanted to start looking at was the road cross section. So as you heard, we want to protect or separate people. Uh, we need to narrow lanes. Uh, we need to get speeds down. Um, and so we wanted to look at what are the cross sections and what, what can we start to, to play with? Um, what we found was there are actually no arterial cross sections uh, standards for North Cowichan. So every arterial uh, has the same as a collector road in North Cowichan right now. Um, but what we found is that there's an excessive amount of asphalt uh, for each of these collector roads and uh, urban roads. Um, the lanes are too wide. Um, the lanes uh, on the rural roadway are wider than a standard highway lane, just to give you a uh, perspective. So the, the roads in North Cowichan, um, you know, feel and are designed like a highway at this moment, which again, illustrates why people are speeding, but also why the pedestrians and bikes are feeling very uncomfortable um, when they're given only 1.2 meters of width and the car is given almost four meters or in the uh, urban case, six meters, which is close to two travel lanes. Um, we, we will be preparing new ones uh, that will start to reduce the travel lanes to an appropriate uh, width, which is probably in the 3.3 .3 to 3.5 meter range. Um, that will depend on if it's a truck route, a bus route, um, or a, a more general uh, passenger vehicle road. Um, the direction we're going is to, in, in order to provide that protection and separation for bikes and peds, we're working towards uh, using more multi-use paths and pathways rather than wide shoulders or on-road on features, particularly in the rural sections. Um, and we're looking at retrofitting some of their existing roads where 
you know, we have six lanes uh, for a travel lane and we really only need the 3.3, what do we do with that other 2.7? Um, so at trees, at landscaping, uh, where bike facilities may not be needed in the urban environment um, and potentially adding those protected, uh, fully protected bike facilities. So here's sort of the uh, direction we're going with the rural uh, cross section. So, you know, we'd have our travel zone. We'd, this is probably wider than it would need to be. We'd probably narrow that down. Uh, some sort of landscape buffer, um, ideally with some trees and then a, a multi-use zone uh, for, the, for the bikes and pedestrians. Um, so that will help us keep the rural nature of the roadways. It will help us keep the character and uh, it will also help us uh, maintain existing vegetation, but add more vegetation, which helps us reduce heat islands, reduce climate change uh, impacts and uh, narrow the road visually and just generally make it a more pleasant experience for people to bike, walk and drive. Um, similarly to the collector roads and arterial roads, um, we get almost nine meters of asphalt for our local roads. Um, again, we're still building highway lanes on our local residential roads. Um, so again, we'll be looking at some retrofit guides that staff can use as well as new cross sections for new roadways. Um, and in part of those uh, retrofit guidelines will be reducing the rural lanes, uh, dealing with the shoulders and, uh, and trees trying to get more trees in, in general. Um, and then for the urban cross sections, uh, we're gonna be looking at how do we narrow, again, narrow those roads. Right now we have uh, pretty excessive uh, width if there's parking on both sides of the road and if that parking isn't used, is that too much park, too much road width? Um, and so the local roads will sort of be focusing more on sidewalks, parking, uh, whether that's in bays or on street, is that on street one side, both sides, and then incorporating bikes uh, through bicycle boulevards and neighborhood bikeways. Um, and really those function best um, where we can keep the speeds low uh, as shown in this image. So our next steps are to finish drafting that bicycle network and uh, identifying the key elements of the bicycle facilities, uh, same for the pedestrian network. Um, we will then roll those in with the vehicle cross sections to create new road cross sections uh, that accommodate all users, as well as identifying uh, retrofit guidelines. Uh, and what we're gonna be doing for the major network, so uh, for example, Maple Bay Road, Lakes Road, Heard Road, Sherman Road, um, is providing you uh, providing the district with some guidelines on how they could retrofit what they have there today. So uh, using the items above to say, okay, well, here's how you could start to retrofit these guidelines and turn these into a project um, that will help accelerate uh, implementation of the bicycle and pedestrian network. Um, we will engage with BC Transit further um, on their process because they're in the middle of their uh, transit future plan. Um, we'll be updating the traffic calming policy to add new features, but also to uh, help provide uh, the district staff with um, a process for, uh, rather than dealing with one-off issues, making sure that uh, it's a community uh, supported project rather than the complaint of one person in a neighborhood. Um, we'll be looking at the parking and TDM policies and how we can further strengthen the uh, uh, use of alternative modes. Um, as the OCP project moves along, we have built a uh, region-wide uh, model uh, that will allow us to project the future traffic uh, based on uh, the land use expected in the OCP. Uh, and once we have that modeling completed, uh, we'll be able to look at the road volumes and intersection volumes in the long term to determine if additional long-term improvements need to be planned for. Um, obviously, there'll be several more check-ins with this council. Um, following that, we'll prioritize the improvements uh, in draft form, and then we will engage in phase three, which is to start to take that back to the public and uh, finalize the plan. That is all I have. So I will pass it back to Dave. 
Thank you, Nadine. Um, in keeping with the information that uh, Nadine and WAP Consulting have provided and the uh, joint council meeting tonight, the staff looked at a few of the issues that we thought uh, might be of interest for councils to discuss. And I'd like to share those uh, with you briefly once I can share my screen. So hoping that you're able to see something now, I'll begin uh, just a very brief uh, slide presentation. And so as I introduced this point, uh, very few number of questions that staff thought would be of interest for councils to consider and potentially give staff some direction uh, for further information. So to begin with, uh, a question about what the city might be considering with respect to alternate or safer modes uh, from Boys Road area to the city. Um, issues such as crossing the Trans-Canada Highway is an example, as well as a cycling route. Recognizing that this was an issue in the corridor study uh, earlier on in uh, in and around 2014. Secondly, is the city considering cycling routes along Trunk and Coronation Streets? Uh, currently, there are no dedicated areas for cyclists on either of these routes. Uh, there is sidewalk provision, uh, but there isn't dedicated cycling lanes. Uh, although coming in from Zuhalem Road, uh, there is the traffic signal and as uh, cyclists would find out there isn't anything to continue on westward into town uh, nor on a return trip also will the city consider cycling type connections to the core from the main feeder roads i'm using examples of couch and lake road gibbons road area uh, where there isn't infrastructure in place except for shared lanes. Uh, so as an example, Government Street varies from uh, a well-defined cycling route, albeit modal three, uh, where it is in the roadway, uh, to shared lanes in the most congested area of Cairns Moor and Gibbons Road Roundabout. There are other roads uh, that may be under consideration for the same sort of treatment as we recognize uh, for North Cowich and at least uh, increase in density and activity around Berkey's Corner, as well as in the Cowich and Commons Mall area, um, both of which might uh, benefit from having that connection to the city. And then the last question that I have is with respect to the bypass route that has come up from time to time in transportation planning. And the question is really uh, whether this is a good time to raise that issue and begin discussion again, given that we now have a regional hospital uh, it's located just outside of the current core uh, in the Bill McKinnon area, and there'll be growth associated with that. The overall growth uh, on Vancouver Island and the subsequent transportation uh, may also bring this notion of a bypass uh, to the forefront again. And we're recognizing that it's a long-term issue, uh, but uh, planning for that would need to begin now if uh, we were to really uh, put some thought to where that would be and what the impacts are on our transportation network as we plan today for the next 20 years. And that concludes uh, what I've had to add this evening. Uh, on behalf of Watt uh, and North Couch and staff, uh, thank Council for listening. 
Uh, thank you so much. So in terms of the questions that you um, have posed, I'm gonna to turn to um, Mr. Murphy, I believe. I do wanna mention that one in three are, um, when we did a lot, when I first came on to, to council, which was about nine years ago now, I recall a, a joint, there was a, um, a joint pl plan that we had with Couch and Tribes, um, North Couch and, and the city that went forward to the Ministry of Transportation at that time that spoke to both of those things. And they were just never acted on by the, um, <clears throat> by the province. But those were, I can't, I believe I've been at a number of meetings where those have come up actually but that they were in that plan from not long ago. So you're right when you say it's a long-term plan because that's nine years ago and I'm sure they were on the docket long before I knew about them. But um, I will uh, pass this on to Mr. Murphy to follow up on those questions. Is that right with you? Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, so thank you, Mayor Staples. So through both mayors to both councils, uh, yeah, so I think the, the best step would be to uh, review uh, our presentation, which will give a sense of where we're at in our process. And those sorts of specifics are absolutely uh, being considered and form the next phase of our work. And the next phase is about detailed network plans and gaining feedback on those plans and proposals. And so for instance, uh, a, you know, a bike route network. Um, and uh, so absolutely that forms the basis of the next phase of work on our transportation mobility strategy, uh, which also involves another phase of engagement uh, so including stakeholders such as North Cowichan uh, and public feedback as well. And so, so those sorts of detailed questions uh, will certainly come out of the next phase. And uh, we welcome any uh, joint discussions on, on those important items. Uh, for us, the most important topic in our transportation and mobility strategy is those connection points. Uh, it's the traffic that comes to Duncan and through Duncan uh, that comes via all those access or the connection points that were listed there. Uh, those connection points, in my view, uh, at least is they have far more impact on the transportation through Duncan uh, than even our own development and growth, because there's so much uh, growth and development in the region around us that those connection points are critical. And those are the ones we want to discuss. So those are very much the discussions we want to have. We want to talk consultant to consultant, staff to staff, and council to council on those very important connection points. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. And I'd just like to ask if there's any questions of the, um, the presenters of, of Ms. King, is there anyone who'd like to ask a question? Um, Councillor Duncan, and then is it okay with you, Mayor Sebring, if I just call the questions without, okay. So Councillor Duncan and then Councillor Douglas. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I was just wondering if there was any consideration for uh, powered scooters uh, and for um, you know, the four wheel scooters as well as part of you know, incorporating that into the bike lanes or, uh, and I'm fully supportive of uh, any cycling paths that we can integrate with North Couch. So that would be, I believe to Ms. King, my yes. question. Um, yeah, the intention is that we would, especially where we're doing the multi-use paths would be to incorporate uh, those types of scooters. And then we'll also be looking at uh, where it's appropriate to put the two wheeled scooters, um, whether that's in bike facilities or sidewalks, but making sure that each of those is appropriately sized uh, to accommodate uh, all the different types of users. Thank and you. also 
I was going to say also the connections are very important as well because we would hate to build one type of infrastructure and a different type is in Duncan and there is that lack of connectivity. So um, I, I echo what everyone's been saying about how we need to work together on those connection points for sure. Absolutely, thank you. Councillor Douglas. Mayor Staples, I had a quick comment and a question. Uh, the first, just re with regards to this notion of a bypass, and I obviously can't speak on behalf of my fellow council members, but I, I would be concerned with us going down that route. I mean, if you look at the current uh, highway corridor that was built in 1958 as a, a, a bypass, and um, uh, you know, previous decision makers decided to develop along that corridor to get us in this current situation. And I just think in this day and age as we're trying to uh, adapt to the, the effects of climate change, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, I would hate to see us put so many resources, whether it's local resources or provincial into to creating something, uh, infrastructure that would be so uh, automobile centric in, in this day and age. Um, so that, that was the comment, the, the question, um, from for Ms. King was with regards to the uh, transportation plan. The there there was you did mention the the road cross sections, and I think you explained why the arterial roads were included. But I wasn't totally clear on that. Just was wondering if you could elaborate. Yeah. So previously they weren't included uh, in the standards uh, as part of this plan. We will be creating a separation between uh, arterial and collector, so that there will be uh, three distinctive. Uh, uh, hierarchies of roads in North Cowichan um, and uh, that they are each sized appropriately for the different types of facilities that are expected along that corridor, those corridors. Um, and I also wanted to mention in that, uh, in terms of the local roads, we're going to expand from just rural versus um, urban. And because uh, there's a, a sort of a third category in there, which is single family neighborhoods. Um, and they are quite different than an urban road that is uh, for more multifamily and commercial development, but also different from lower density rural roads. So we're looking at incorporating that third uh, type of local road to, to be more, you know, to try and be more specific and handle, um, you know, single family versus multifamily and commercial. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Brooke and then Mayor Sebring. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, a comment and a question um, on transit. Uh, to my untrained eye, I find transit to be a particularly inefficient way of moving a very limited number of people. And just wondered, I uh, have no idea what transit costs are. Um, just wondered uh, if there is a plan to perhaps create a more efficient uh, uh, transit method for a, you know, semi-rural areas. Um, on, on the bypass, I just wonder, was there ever any drawings done uh, on, a, on a route proposal that a person could look at to get an idea of, of where we're at on that now? Thank you. Uh, Dave, do you want to go first maybe before me? I certainly could take a try at that. Uh, um, thank you, Councillor Brooke, and uh, to the mayor, to you. Uh, with respect to the bypass, uh, there have been a few drawings uh, showing the uh, schematic or very preliminary route uh, as recently as the uh, corridor plan that was uh, prepared in about 2014 with the Ministry of Transportation and Highways, as well as the City of Duncan and with some support of North Cowichan, where there was a uh, short bypass and a long bypass on the west side of the city, as well as a short and long bypass route on the east side of the city. Uh, so there are at, at least some uh, fat lines on a drawing suggesting where the routes might go between the north and the south side. And I'm sorry, but I've forgotten the other question that was asked. Oh, I, I can take that one. Um, that was around the transit and is there a way to make the non uh, 
or in the more rural suburban areas, a more efficient service. Um, that will be, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of uh, significant ability to direct that. It would be up to BC Transit planning, but we can, both communities can provide input through the futures plan um, and, uh, and ask them to particularly look at that to see if there is uh, a better way to, so there's sort of kind of two options. One is sort of what you have, which is your very spread out low frequency system, or it could be we focus on more key corridors with more frequent service and the more dense or uh, sparse areas would have less service or no service. And uh, one of the things that we would like to identify is, you know, uh, in consultation with the OCP process for North Cowichan is how much density is needed to actually start to make those services more, um, more viable uh, and more frequent than they are today. Thank you, um, Mayor Sebring. Thank you, Mayor Staples. And just on that transit piece, a lot of that is uh, discussed and, and really sort of fleshed out at the regional district because, of course, transit is a, is a regional piece. I just want to go back to, and I think it was about your fourth slide, and I've got it on paper here. It was entitled modal split in terms of the, um, the percentage of, of uh, various types of transportation that's used. And uh, your numbers show that BC wide, 70% of people uh, do the auto driver thing. And um, here in North Carolina, you know, it's 83%. And I'm just wondering what those provincial statistics are, are based on, because, you know, again, it goes back to the transit question. If I'm on the lower mainland and I have uh, transit available to me, um, there's less of a chance I'm gonna, I'm gonna use uh, my my own personal vehicle, and not only that, but you know the distances in in North Cowichan are are considerably different in terms of density than they are in places like Vancouver and Surrey and Burnaby, where I can step out my door and and you know walk a block and a half, and I'm at Save On Foods or Walmart or wherever I need to be. Where here, uh, it's really not realistic to expect people to jump on their bicycle in. Uh, Crofton if they want to, you know, if they have an optometrist appointment in, in DACA. So it's a, it's a different scenario. And I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that, yeah, we have higher uh, car auto driver and auto passenger rates than, than province wide, but we are different. And, and I'm just wondering how big a factor that those lower mainland numbers were in driving that BC wide number down to 70%, because I'm sure if you go to someplace like Fort St. John, the numbers are going to be higher than ours. So do we have any sense of that? Yeah, for sure. I, uh, it would be based totally on population. So of course, Vancouver and Lower Mainland would be driving um, some of that because they make a little larger proportion of the provincial uh, population. Um, you know, the 83%, as you said, is it would be similar to what we have seen in some of the more, as you said, Fort St. John, Northern regions, uh, more, uh, I guess, spread out communities uh, in terms of that you are a very large, North Carolina is a very large community uh, from edge to edge. I think I measured you're about 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers roughly um, in any direction. So uh, I think the intent of the modal split is just to say, to give you a marker of where we are today, and then we can set some goals to start, you know, seeing if we can make adjustments. Will we get to 70%? Uh, or 50% uh, like Vancouver has, uh, you know, as you said, unlikely, um, but, you know, starting to move the needle a little bit, uh, you know, to get that maybe under 80% or, uh, you know, down to 75% uh, in 30 years. Um, and so part of what phase two will be to be try to identify some of those draft goals to bring back to council to see, um, uh, where your comfort is with that level. Are we pushing it too far? Are we not being aggressive enough? Um, yeah. And also once we get the travel survey, we'll also be able to see uh, by the sub regions within. So how do Maple Bay people commute versus Crofton people versus uh, people in Berkey's corner? Um, yeah. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. I just wanted to provide that context. We couldn't, I couldn't just leave those numbers hanging there without that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sebring. Uh, Councillor Duncan and then Councillor, actually Councillor Justice, you haven't spoken, and then Councillor Duncan. 
Thank you, Mayor Staples. Uh, a question for Ms. King. Um, I believe Saanich is involved in a pilot program lowering speed limits uh, to 30 kilometers an hour on all local roads. Um, are, you, uh, are you following that? And is that something that you might be uh, considering looking at for North Couch? Um, I am following it. Uh, so what uh, Saanich has done as well as uh, they've recruited a few other adjacent municipalities in the Greater Victoria region uh, is to pilot for three years, taking all basically what they're classifying as residential local roads or basically any road without a center line uh, that is local uh, to 30 kilometers an hour by default rather than the current. If it's not posted, it's 50 kilometers an hour. Um, the pilot hasn't uh, kicked off as far as I know, they just have passed the bylaw, um, or sorry, they've passed the motion at council. Um, so it is something that North Cowichan could uh, consider at the council level passing a similar um, a motion uh, to pilot in North Cowichan as well. Um, ideally we'll get some results uh, shortly uh, from it to see if it is something that we would suggest um, North Couch and also considers. I do think it has merit, uh, particularly as you said, in those residential single family neighborhoods, um, you know, where we're trying to create a more uh, sharing of the network uh, rather than it just being for cars zipping through the neighborhood. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you again, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'd like to echo uh, Councillor Douglas's views on a bypass. I would rather be spending money on housing than encouraging more vehicle traffic. We're only talking about five or six traffic lights here. And I also uh, want to ask, um, what about the ENN corridor? Uh, I think Langford is using some of that already. Was there anything uh, in the surveys and then research around the ENN corridor and perhaps getting access to that? Uh, we didn't hear anything back from the surveys for North Cowichan on that, but I would definitely say that is something on the table for phase two. Um, so Greater Victoria is using uh, part of the ENN uh, corridor in Greater Victoria from basically Esquimalt all the way to Langford uh, to build a uh, basically a second galloping goose or a second multi-use pathway. Uh, that's, I believe it's three meters, uh, potentially maybe up to four meters where that's not constrained um, to provide a, a lovely trail system. And what is, uh, what is great about the using the rail corridors is that they have wonderful grades already built into them that we're not talking steep grades uh, in most places. So that'll definitely be something that uh, we will be considering for North Cowichan and then ideally where it ties in with uh, the city of Duncan uh, along Canada Avenue there, where you do have some uh, existing trail uh, system. Uh, I think that would be a significant benefit for uh, both communities. Thank you. Any other questions from council before we move on to the next presentation? I don't see any hands up. So thank you very much, um, Ms. King for your presentation and Mr. Conway, much appreciated. And uh, we're going to move on to the delegation uh, from Urban Systems. So I'm just going to ask before that council extend the delegation time to over 10 minutes. Could I have a mover and a seconder? All those in favor? Excellent. And with that, I will introduce um, Dan Casey from Urban Systems. Welcome, Dan. Good, thank you, I appreciate that and um, really appreciate um, the opportunity to be here tonight. I think this is a very um, great way to go about collaboration between neighboring communities and, and really pleased um, to be working for the city on this, but also being part of a process that's being done uh, in a collaborative way like this. So thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, and also appreciate the, um, the additional minutes over the 10 minute allotment and I'm gonna need uh, five or 10 minutes more than those 10 minutes. So really appreciate that as well. So what I wanted to do tonight, um, we've been working very closely with uh, Brian Murphy and your entire staff, uh, staff team at the City of Duncan on this transportation and mobility strategy. And so what I wanted to do tonight was similar to the presentation that was given for North Cowichan, 
is provides uh, an overview of the work that's being done to date, both uh, technical and uh, engagement, and then uh, shed some light on some of the key findings to date, and then moving forward, what, um, what the next steps might be. So I'm gonna share my screen here um, and just let me know So do we see a session overview slide? Okay, so a um, bit of an overview for the presentation tonight. First background and working paper, the working paper being our technical paper we've developed to date. We're gonna talk to the framework that's been developed, so the early workings of the transportation and mobility strategy, talk to next steps, and, and we've got some leading questions uh, similar to um, what was posed earlier. And so we've got a series of leading questions we'd like to walk the group through as well. So can everyone see my screen all right? There's a very colorful slide up right now. Give me a head nod just to reassure me here. Great, okay. Okay, so process and timeline for the transportation mobility strategy, which I'll, I'll probably refer to as TMS, just for simplicity here. Uh, we've got essentially a four phase project. The first phase is about project startup and communications planning. And that was um, really um, uh, executed through the spring of this year, earlier this year. We are nearing the, phase, the end of our phase two, which is really the technical review and developing community understanding. And the key takeaway, key deliverable from that phase is the working paper number one, which uh, was included uh, in full uh, in the agenda package. And uh, I'm gonna provide an overview of that document, but there's quite a bit of material in there. So definitely encourage you to, um, to, uh, to dig in and, and see what's in there. We'll be moving into the fall into phase three, which is about starting to establish some of the key strategy directions for the TMS. And that phase of work will include both technical work as well as um, stakeholder conversation and community engagement. And similar to phase two, it'll be summarized in a, another one of these working papers, which really are meant to sort of track our progress and track our work along the way, leading toward the final document. And then phase four, which uh, we plan to undertake into the winter and into early 2022, which will be about drafting the, the, the draft and the final transportation mobility strategy document. Um, intentionally, this is being undertaken as a coordinated process. And so uh, both the TMS and the city's official community plan review are being uh, undertaken directly alongside one another. It's actually uh, my colleagues who I um, sit beside here who are also the consulting team for the official command community plan review. And we've been working very closely with um, city staff members in planning, engineering, and, and other departments to make sure that these processes uh, run seamlessly alongside one another. Also wanted to highlight, and some of this has been highlighted earlier tonight, and you're probably aware of much of this yourselves, is that um, there are a number of um, past or concurrent regional initiatives that are being undertaken that uh, help inform the understanding for the work we're doing here, as well as provide an opportunity for real um, collaboration and making sure that um, the plans that are developed in the various jurisdictions are really coordinated with one another. And so from the from the city of Duncan's perspective, North Cowichan is a very obvious one, both through a master transportation plan and official community plan processes. We have had conversations with Cowichan tribes and they have a past transportation and mobility plan that's helped provide a nice foundation for the work we're doing. The uh, regional district is just getting going on a regional active transportation network plan which will have implications and, and opportunity for coordination with um, the, the various local governments, including Duncan. We've also had discussions with uh, CBRD Transit and BC Transit staff, um, sort of generally around public transit in the Cowichan Valley, as well as specifically on this transit future action plan process that they're um, just getting going on now. And so discussions around how that might influence uh, transportation planning in Duncan and vice versa. 
And then lastly, and it's been referenced as the um, Trans-Canada Highway Corridor Management Planning work that happened in uh, 2014, 2015, I believe it was, and really starts to set some direction for what might happen along with the highway corridor. So a lot of, a lot of coordination, a lot of collaboration, and it's all really good. So as part of our um, phase two, which was included our first phase of engagement, we hosted uh, a number of uh, events and opportunities for public engagement. Uh, some of the key um, participation numbers are shown uh, on the screen to the left. And so we have a place speak page, which is the, the home page, the web page for this process that's being sort of continually updated as the project moved along. We had a online survey, um, response rate of uh, approximately 43 uh, responses. We've had shares on social media, and we uh, also had a pop-up event uh, at the um, at the Duncan Market through the summer. And so I had a number of uh, residents come up and engage through that. Some of the key engagements uh, opportunities included, like I mentioned, the pop-ups included an online survey that included a really neat interactive mapping uh, opportunity that allowed residents to uh, log in and, and drop um, uh, geo-referenced uh, feedback in specific locations around issues and opportunities. Um, and then we've um, been working through a, a, a Pretty nice and collaborative uh, stakeholder and uh, First Nations uh, um, conversations to help uh, work jurisdiction to jurisdiction on this. So I touched on most of these already, but our, our key stakeholders, we've got a number of stakeholders that are going to be engaged at a, a certain levels. Uh, our very key ones include uh, Municipality of North Cowichan, Cowichan Tribes, the CBRD, uh, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, so the province as well as BC Transit. And then we have um, a number of other community uh, organizations with a, a direct stake in transportation, transportation planning, that are gonna be engaged um, more one-to-one um, uh, -one and as part of some of the official community plan stakeholder um, activities that are being held as well. So our transportation team will be plugged in through those OCP engagements. Hey, Dan, your volume, your volume is going up and down to me. I don't know how, everybody else is making out, but sometimes you go very, very faint. Okay. So I'm gonna say if it gets bad, I've actually logged on uh, twice. And I have an, a backup means of using a microphone. So do let me know if it's getting to the point and I can, I can jump, up, jump onto my backup method. Thanks, it was good for a while and then it's sort of going in and out again, so. Okay. Do do interrupt me. Let me know if it gets bad. I I want to I want to make sure that this is all coming through pretty clear. So through our online survey, uh, we've had a chance to um, summarize some of the feedback to some of our key questions and prompts, and start to make sense out of um, at a at a background level what some of the key issues and opportunities uh, might be. And so we asked the question uh, by mode by travel mode. Uh, what are some of the top issues in Duncan? And so the top issues for each of the primary travel modes for walking, we heard that it was a lack of safe crossing locations on busy major roads. For cycling, we heard it was a lack of, of established bike routes. For public transit, we heard that the service isn't frequent enough during the day. And for driving, the top issue was highlighted as too much traffic during rush hour. And so again, encourage you to um, uh, flip open the working paper where uh, all of the other issues that were identified are also in there, these being the top for each of the travel modes. We asked what are the, the, um, the most important outcomes for the TMS? The top three responses were one, improving road safety for all road users. So I think for, for all users is, is quite key in that statement. Number two is around providing more transportation choices. And number three was about improving environmental outcomes related to transportation. We also asked questions around uh, factors or opportunities to reduce transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. We heard in order top three, one was building more sidewalks and trails, two was providing more frequent transit service, and three was providing more and better transit routes. So feedback specifically around uh, facilitating walking and rolling as well as access to public transit. 
So we'll shift gears here a little bit and now talk, um, previously we were talking public engagement takeaways. Now I'm gonna to move to some of the um, technical activities that have been undertaken and some of the, the, the findings or the baseline understanding from those. I think you should you should switch your, to your other microphone, please, Dan. Let's do that. Give me one second here. Thank you. Okay, I'll test there. That's very echoey. Yeah. Okay. How about how about now? I think that sounds good. Okay, great. Everyone else, that's yeah, that sounds good so far. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Works for me. So, um, similar to what was highlighted in the um, the North Cowichan presentation, uh, we've pulled together some of the existing um, uh, mode split data. So, what's shown on the screen in front of you is uh, the modal split for the city's commute trips, 77% by vehicle, either as driver or passenger, 3% by transit, 16% uh, walking, 2% uh, as uh, cyclist. And so I'll, I'll highlight here that the walking mode share in Duncan is uh, quite high compared to many British Columbia communities. And we do see um, the shares uh, of public transit use and cycling relatively low and, and sort of, we'll say relatively consistent with what we might see in, in some other um, provincial um, jurisdictions as well. Um, we have, sorry, we have information also on um, trip distance. And so the graph in front of us is showing the breakdown of uh, all trips uh, as a percentage by, um, by distance. And the key takeaway here really is that um, for City of Duncan trips, the 66%, um, so two thirds of trips are five kilometers or less. And that's a nice piece of understanding for the work that we're doing so that we can start to um, rationalize and be realistic with the um, proportion of trips that might be um, uh, encouraged to be taken by say walking or cycling as we try and um, uh, encourage people to travel by more uh, sustainable and healthier modes. So we've also got information on um, trip origins and destinations. So where trips uh, that um, uh, uh, originate or end in Duncan, uh, where they're beginning or ending. And so the visual that's shown on the screen here to the right uh, is um, showing the percentage of all trips that originate in uh, Duncan, where it is their, their destination is. And so some of the key take, there's a lot that can be taken from this information, but some of the key takeaways that um, we're gonna work with are 28% uh, of those trips begin and then end in Duncan. And so the inset, uh, the top right of the screen actually shows we've got zones established within Duncan itself, but a key takeaway being almost one third, 28% uh, uh, begin and end in Duncan. Also a uh, key stat and particularly um, relevant for, for our, our session this evening is that 42% of trips that begin in Duncan and somewhere in North Cowichan. And so again, the visual on the right shows uh, a few different zones within North Cowichan and, uh, and what percentage of those trips are, are, are destined for which areas of North Cowichan, but really worth acknowledging that there's a very significant number of uh, Duncan beginning trips that end in North Cowichan and vice versa. Very important uh, to the discussion tonight. Um, and another piece of information, just, just very quickly, it may be more out of interest than anything, uh, but it will factor into um, how, how we end up projecting out future travel demand. Um, this is a graph showing um, uh, vehicle volumes on a, a segment of Trans-Canada Highway for the time periods through 2019 and 2020. And we really wanted to isolate uh, the difference in condition uh, pre and post um, COVID-19 condition. And so uh, really what we start to see is um, through March and April of 2020, when um, COVID really hit, uh, the difference was significant. 
And so we're talking uh, 30, 40, 40% 40 plus reduction in the number of, of trips that were through that point. And then we start to see it come back in the latter half of 2020, where we're at generally between 10, 15% lower than we have been in previous years. So an indication, not necessarily um, the answer, but uh, a general indication of what the impact of COVID was or continues to be perhaps on trip making. So I wanted to talk just quickly to some of the existing networks. Um, quite a bit of work went into understanding what's in place today. And this is our foundation for some of the next steps that'll be um, undertaken and leading toward the, the final plan. So specific to walking and rolling, uh, we're looking at the current network uh, map on the screen here. It shows uh, locations with sidewalks on both sides of the road in green, sidewalks on one side of the road in yellow, and uh, areas where sidewalks are not in place in red. A few key stats, there's about 30, approximately 30 kilometers of linear sidewalk in place in Duncan. It varies from um, you know, under a, a meter and a half, some, some places less to up over two meters in places. Also wanted to highlight in recent years, there's been a real push to install um, pedestrian uh, activated flashers, so um, uh, RRFBs, in a number of crosswalk locations. So there are currently 14 of those. And there's a photo on the top right just demonstrating what those what those look like. And it's it's been it's really encouraging to see those in place and know that uh, locations where pedestrian uh, crossing volumes are highest and some of the safety concerns are greatest, that um, uh, there's that. Uh, heightened uh, treatment in place to help aid in safety concerns. Specific to cycling, uh, the network plan here is showing uh, location of painted bicycle lanes in, in solid green and shared bike lanes where um, shared lane markings, sharrows are in place uh, with the dotted green. And so uh, definitely not the same level of coverage uh, in the bike network as we saw with the sidewalk network, uh, approximately a kilometer and a half of painted bike lanes in place throughout the city. So fair ways to go there, and that will absolutely be an emphasis of the network planning and implementation that um, comes out of the TMS. Public transit, um, wanted to highlight just your current um, transit routes, transit network through throughout the city. Um, we did want to highlight sort of on, uh, on, a, on a sad note, we'll say there are, there are two bus stop locations currently that have shelters out of the entire system. And so something we do wanna work through the TMS process and work through with BC Transit, with CBRD Transit, as well as the public to help uh, identify where locations for future transit shelter installation might be highest priority and help work through a process of starting to establish um, funding and to secure external funding to help um, improve the coverage. And lastly, uh, the road network. Um, the network plan in front of us is showing uh, highway corridor in red, arterials in blue, collectors in uh, the orange, and then local streets in gray. We also have uh, identified the location of laneways, which are, are something we're looking to um, uh, establish uh, appropriate design for through this, through this project. And so really this is showing our base case for the road network, and we're gonna be working through this process to um, revisit uh, and confirm this road network, including um, uh, better alignment with the official community plan as it uh, progresses and a couple of the past um, local area plans that have been developed, including the, the neighborhood plan for Cairnsmore, which starts to establish some sort of more current, more recent um, thinking around uh, road network and street classifications. A very neat piece of the um, background technical work that was undertaken. Um, uh, we engaged uh, alongside our team, uh, an individual named Stan Levenhorst with Universal Access Design to undertake an independent accessibility audit of your community. Uh, his, um, he is a specialist who does basically entirely accessibility audits and accessible design. And so he completed a, a inventory and audit of your community and highlighted both some high level sort of um, uh, high level recommendations, I guess, things to improve on generally, as well as a number of specific locations where infrastructure fixes would help um, improve uh, universal design. And so a few of the overarching priority recommendations on the screen in front of us 
to repair pathway surfaces at intersection crosswalks, to upgrade pedestrian railway crossings, to create level passage on islands in pedestrian travel path and highlighting specifically uh, out on the highway, and then upgrading curb ramps uh, where they don't have level landing. And so where a curb ramp might come down onto a, a non-level surface, um, really addressing that as a priority. So there's a whole bunch of um, more detailed um, direction and um, recommendations through Stan's work. And that's been rolled in as part of working paper number one, as part of our background and will be brought forward when we're considering recommendations uh, around accessibility and then probably specifically how they impact the pedestrian network. Okay, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about the transportation mobility strategy framework. This is these are the early workings of the um, final uh, plan document. And so I think similar to the presentation earlier for um, North Cowichan, we've established um, a working uh, vision goals and principles for the TMS. And so these were posed to uh, Duncan Council a number of months ago in their initial form and they continue to um, evolve and take form as the process moves along. So um, the uh, draft, working draft vision for transportation and for the TMS is the city of Duncan's transportation network will support mobility for all. The multimodal transportation network will be enjoyable and functional for all users and support a shift toward active and sustainable transportation. People of all ages and abilities will have convenient, safe, and accessible transportation options. Short trips can be fulfilled by walking, while cycling and transit will be convenient and practical choices for longer trips that are integrated throughout the Cowichan Valley. Goods movement and personal vehicle movement will also be important parts of the multimodal system to ensure the, the city's continued economic prosperity as the heart of the Cowichan Valley. The transportation system will seek to create and support a vibrant, livable, healthy, and sustainable community for residents, businesses, and visitors alike. So that's the vision to guide the work that's being undertaken and sort of starts to describe what the end results of successful implementation of the plan will look like. Six uh, specific goals have been identified. They are uh, design. So streets that support multimodal movement and are complete destinations. Collaboration, enhancing the network in partnership with both service providers and adjacent jurisdictions. Connect, provide connections to important destinations. Sustainable, reduce transportation related emissions and environmental impacts. Character, build upon Duncan's character and role as the economic core for the region. And lastly, around uh, investment or invest. So make balanced, equitable investments in Duncan's transportation infrastructure, services, and maintenance. And so then lastly, four key principles have been established and they're not necessarily goals for the plan, but they're principles that drive the, 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 the thinking and the, um, the, the, the planning process that goes into the plan as well as, as, well as principles to be referenced once the plan's complete and implementation uh, starts to occur. And so uh, modal hierarchy is one, and we are gonna test this with the community as well around thinking a, an approach to transportation projects, transportation infrastructure, and how we prioritize the different modes. And so in descending order, walking, biking, transit, goods movement, multiple occupant vehicles, and then single occupant vehicles. Other key principles include um, all ages and abilities or AAA, and the idea being that uh, planning and design around transportation is meant to accommodate people of all ages and abilities. Land use integration is another one. So recognizing the um, interrelationship between land use planning and development and transportation. And there's, a, there's a, an old saying that goes, the, the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. And so we're gonna take that to, to heart on this process. And then lastly, uh, this work around complete streets. And so the idea being that no longer do we plan transportation around movement of vehicles, that we really look at streets as public rights of way that can not only achieve movement of vehicles, but also a whole host of other, whether it's multimodal transportation or other objectives as well. So I'll finish up here um, quickly with, um, overview of next steps. So we'll be working through the fall on a number of technical activities, including um, traffic uh, road network modeling, 
We'll be developing multimodal networks around the various modes. There'll be design guidelines that are developed that when we see lines on the map around where cycling facilities or pedestrian facilities or streets might be, there's a there are guidelines, there's a description of how they're to be designed and what they might actually look like and function like. And they'll be supporting policies and programs that help um, support the infrastructure goals and the infrastructure plans that are presented in the TMS. We're also moving into a, a, a subsequent round of engagement. So that includes top of the list, this joint council meeting. Uh, it's going to include and has included over the past week or two um, conversations with key stakeholders and will continue to. We have workshops upcoming for the official community plan review that there will also be transportation presence at. So we, we look forward to hearing from a broad range of stakeholder groups through those engagements. And then we are, are working to sort of finalize our approach to um, public activities, but more than likely we're looking at another round of uh, an online survey as well as pop-up events that um, uh, uh, take our team out to where people are uh, congregating and, and seek feedback that way. Our next key deliverable at the end of the, that phase of work will be another working paper. And so I think the um, working, the proposed working paper outline that was included in the agenda package, it's on the screen here in front of us, but we will be going through um, presenting some of, again, what we heard from the community and stakeholders, the refined uh, TMS framework, and then we'll be going mode by mode and starting to talk about um, what we heard specifically from the community for that mode, what the long-term network might be, design guidelines by mode, uh, as well as um, starting to work through what some of the priority improvements might be for each mode. So where to, where to, where to consider investing effort and, and finances uh, first to get sort of the biggest bang for buck, we'll say. So we'll conclude with that. Um, I've left, uh, we've left a number of um, sort of leading questions here on the screen that um, just to generate uh, conversation and uh, in the spirit of this um, collaborative session to really sort of uh, draw attention to the regional aspect of, of our discussion tonight. And so I'll leave these on the screen for a moment here and uh, open up the floor, I suppose, um, uh, for a dialogue among council members. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. I'll just give everyone a minute to just look over those before I um, ask you to just minimize the screen so that I can see everyone and see if there's questions. Would it help if I verbal if I read through them? Um, I don't think so. I think we can go to questions and then if we want to put that screen up um, afterwards, that might be a, a better way of doing it. Sure. We can ask questions about the actual presentation. So if we could have the screen, the PowerPoint um, take it down so I can see everyone, that would be great. Happy to. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. I'm going to look for questions. I see um, Mayor Sebring, go ahead. Yeah, just a, a quick one. And I, I don't know which slide it was. We didn't actually have your PowerPoint in our, in our agenda, so it was a little more difficult to follow along. but. Uh, one of the things you talked about was uh, sort of modalities and, and destinations where people went uh, when they originated their trip in Duncan. 28% stayed in Duncan, 42% uh, went in North Cowichan. That still leaves 30%. Is that the commuters to Victoria? Is that Nanaimo? I mean, you know, your your final slide there talked about regional thinking and, and um you know, do we have to think regionally beyond just the boundaries of our two municipalities, if indeed that's a, a bigger part of the, the picture? Do we know where those other 30% were going? Yeah, so um, in, a, in essence, it's it's to the south. So um, uh, we're at 25%, I believe it is, to the um, CBRD to the south. Places like, uh, you know, Cobble Hill, Mill Bay, Couch Bay. Uh, is representing a pretty good proportion of the remainder of the trips. And then there's a trickling north, you know, Ladysmith and beyond, south to Greater Victoria and, and west to, to Lake Howich and, and, and 
those areas. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Duncan. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just, I just more comments. Thank you very much for uh, the, all the hard work you put in. But also, I think this is uh, a time for us to take advantage of the ENN uh, corridor. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, I'd love to have a train, but uh, that's something in the, in the distant future. And I think that we need to use that corridor now to the benefit of the citizens of both the municipality of North Couch and Endock. It, it's level. It's there. It's time to use it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Justice. Thank you. Um, I guess this is a question for Mr. Casey and uh, and Ms. King both. I mean, the, the projects to me seem like they're very compatible, at least in uh, at least in, in principle. Um, I would just wonder if the if the timing of the two projects will allow the uh, the consultants to to get together and do some sort of compatibility analysis or comparison and and identify synergies and, and potential clashes. Is that, is that something that's in the works? Go ahead. I'm Dan. happy to field that first, unless, unless maybe Brian wants to, but I, I think um, awesome comment and something we absolutely intend on doing. And I think there's good familiarity staff to staff. There's good familiarity consultant to consultants. And I think, you know, thinking through the process I'm undertaking for Duncan, uh, Absolutely, there's a ton of value and merit to doing that. So we, we do intend to. And I think from our side, I echo what Dan has said. And I, I do think there is the time um, to do it. Uh, North Couch and maybe a little further ahead, but I think that there's uh, definitely the timing. Uh, sounds like, you know, towards the, the end of the fall that we may be in a, a similar position to at least start having those discussions about uh, those key connection points and making sure um, the synergies are there. Great, thank you both. Um, Councillor Bruce. Thank you, Mayor Staples. And I would just like to thank uh, Dan Casey and Ms. King for their presentations, very interesting. Um, the electric scooters, our population is getting quite a bit older and not myself, of course, but the rest of them. And I'm concerned about uh, bike lanes and scooters and uh, Ms. King talked about that briefly, and I just couldn't understand whether, whether the bicycles and the, and the electric scooters that uh, elderly people are, are they on the same pathway uh, on, on, the, on these plans? Are they on the same pathway? So um, if operated legally as intended, a, uh, a electric bicycle, two-wheeled version would operate in bike lanes or on multi-use pathways and mobility scooters that um, generally older folks are, are, are riding in would operate on sidewalks or, or on pathways as well. And so I guess maybe to just sort of support that is that one of the things that we are hoping to include in the design guidelines that support sidewalk facility development is a... Um, a requirement or a guideline, I suppose, a guideline to make sure that sidewalk widths are such that two mobility scooters can pass in opposing directions. That same guideline or that same width is necessary for uh, individuals in wheelchairs. And the same width is necessary for people like me who are at the stage of life pushing scooter, uh, put it, pushing strollers with children in them. And so there is a really fundamental sidewalk width. And the same thing goes for, um, for, for pathways and trails where we want to hit that um, minimum width threshold so that we can accommodate all these activities. Yeah, and I'll echo what Dan has said is correct. And uh, that's one of the challenges in the North Couch and current standard is they're actually, the sidewalks are not wide enough for that to occur um, and allow two people to pass uh, very safely. So um, yeah, the intention is that the mobility scooters are on the sidewalk uh, or accommodate in multi-use paths and then uh, uh, bike, electric bikes and uh, the more two-wheeled scooters uh, that you sort of see being piloted in other regions uh, could be accommodated uh, safely in the bike facilities. Great, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Sari. Yeah, 
Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to first say this is great that we're having this meeting and that both of our plans are and OCPs are all happening at the same time. And there's a lot of collaboration opportunity with the CVRD as well, um, especially with the transit um, review that's happening right now. So I know you you mentioned it in both reports that um, it, there is that collaboration happening, but can you speak a little bit more to that? I know I participated in one of the engagement sessions that already took place. Um, and kind of forget already what the next steps are with that and how that kind of matches up timeline wise with um, both of these plans taking place and with our OCP. So can you just um, maybe clarify a little bit of that? Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. And, and you're absolutely right. The timing of all this stuff is, 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 is awesome. That's great. Uh, the chat we had with um, BC Transit and CVRD Transit folks, it, it, it seemed to indicate that that process was sort of just getting off the ground and having some of its um, initial outreach conversations and is perhaps a little ways behind where these initiatives are right now. Uh, I think what we did talk about sort of generally with, with folks there was um, a process like that is going to do a very nice job of looking at uh, routing, whether it's a change in routing or, or, or confirming the routing that's in place already, as well as service and service levels. And that stuff especially is best done at a regional level because it has implications for the, the, the system throughout the entire region, not necessarily just Duncan, just North Cowich and really the others. We also talked about um, very specific feedback on transit infrastructure coming from the local governments, the local jurisdictions would be um, very helpful and, and welcomed um, when we go out to the the community with our next round of engagement, for, for example, is to start to um, ask questions around which bus stops might be the most important to upgrade and what sort of upgrades might might they need. Uh, we understand that information would be very much welcomed um, from the folks leading the regional transit initiative. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who hasn't spoken yet? Just before I go to Second time speakers, Councillor Justice, and then Councillor Bruce, and then Mayor Sebring. Thank you. Sorry to ask the second question when we're all anxious to get to the election results. But, um, not too long ago, North Couch and Council passed a uh, resolution asking staff to look into a bylaw to allow uh, neighborhood zero emission vehicles to exist to operate in certain zones in the in the community and um, as part of the, as part of the uh, master transportation plan um, and I was just wondering whether whether Duncan was considering that option as well so to the best of my knowledge that is not something that has come up through our TMS process to date um, I might look over to, to Duncan's staff, is that, is that so from my, from my perspective, I have not heard uh, this as a, as a direction or a, a, an option to date. I would say sort of understanding how these vehicles operate um, and knowing the amount, the, the magnitude of, of cross-border travel that happens, um, it would make a lot of sense if that initiative were coordinated across, across jurisdictions. I, I can add, uh, so through the mayor to Councillor Justice, uh, yes, that's the first mention of that, that we've come across, certainly can give some thought to it. My initial reaction would be, uh, given the small size of Duncan, that uh, use in one area would just lead to someone attempting to travel into other areas which aren't designed for that sort of use. Uh, so where you would, the, the only value would be if there was the ability to transit from one of the residential areas into downtown for shopping, for instance. So unless the network is really set up uh, to accommodate those sorts of vehicles, uh, I my initial reaction would be it probably create more issues than than it would solve. But uh, certainly, we can give it some thought now that it's been mentioned. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bruce. Thank you, Mayor Staples. Um, and I, I'm saying to both councils, would would this not be the time to 
to really all, all of us discuss the bypass. And I know um, Councillor Justice had mentioned not to, or Douglas had mentioned not to uh, do so. But unfortunately, I think the masses, we are going to be overrun with people. We're the best place in Canada to live. That's a beautiful municipality of North Cowichan and the city of Duncan. And it's one gorgeous place to be. People are moving here by the boatload and it's going to get worse or not or better, whatever you want to call it. And even if those roads have just got electric vehicles on them or hydroelectric vehicles, wouldn't it be the time to uh, put that into this plan here, the bypass or start thinking about it? It was thought about way in the old days, but um, I would like to uh, encourage both studies to put the bypass into uh, part of their studies, um, even with a dotted line of some kind, and see if we can't start working on that. Because I don't, I don't. You, everyone here has, all of us have driven through our area here from Boys Road right up to Herd Road, if you will. And it, any afternoon now, it's packed, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Uh. Thank you. I'll move to the consultants first. I, I know that Mr. Divertai did send us the 2014, the link to the 2014 study. So it should be, I actually, I'm not sure if it went to North Couch and, but um, council directly, but it did go to staff. So it would be something to, to look at. There was an, a, a lot of work done at that time. And so I would, I guess, check back in at this point in time with staff and consultants about the likelihood or probability of including that in what we are doing right now, what we're looking at, because there has been an extensive amount of work done on it already. So I'm not sure who to direct that question to. I mean, I, I'm happy through the mayor here to um, comment on behalf of the TMS. I think there is the ability to, that's something we can, um, sort of include either as concept within the plan or at least gauge the public's interest, we'll say, in in an option like that as this process moves forward. I I do think also, I mean, that is a, um, a very, you know, a project that would have a significant impact on the community and how people move around and a, a very important and high level strategic conversation around that, that um, I would encourage sort of at the council level to, to entertain that discussion as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I saw Councillor Capps hand go up. Was that in response to the conversation at hand? Yes, if that's all right, Mayor Staples. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment that I, I really respectfully disagree with Councillor Bruce that now in this plan is the right time to consider that. Um, as just mentioned by Mr. Casey, that's a really high level strategic, long, long term sort of decision. Um, and as well, you know, we, we have seen the materials circulated around that already. I think that if we look at the priorities, the principles and the mobility hierarchy in, in the plan, which I think are, are really well thought out, by the way, um, I think that this is the idea of a bypass would be in, in opposition to those and would involve a lot more parties than those that are involved in this discussion right now. Um, and in general, I, yeah, I just don't think it's the time or place for that discussion now, if ever. Thank you, Councillor Capps. Councillor Douglas, is that in response as well? I would just say everything Councillor Capps said, I totally agree with. Okay. Is there any further discussion on this point right now? If not, I'll move on to Mayor Sebring. Go ahead, Mayor Sebring. Well, actually, I'm gonna, I had something else, but I, I want to talk to this point a little bit too. Um, folks, let's remember here, we're not talking about a, an 18-month or a two-year plan here. We, we, need, to, we need to look, uh, be visionary enough to look 25 to 40 years ahead. And, and if that is uh, part of our mandate, and I believe it is, I don't think we can ignore the traffic impacts that, that or the impacts that, that growth is gonna have on traffic. There is a considerable pressure point 
uh, on those five lights through Duncan. I mean, it's only five traffic lights. I get that. And I mean, we're not the lower mainland and the traffic isn't as bad as the lower mainland. I spend enough time over there to be thankful that I'm back here every time I get off the ferry. But the reality is that if, if, if we are uh, building something longer term, I don't think we can ignore it. I'm not saying we, we design it by the land and do it now, but we, we need to acknowledge that at some point, something is gonna to have to be done about that. Unless we just wanna put up a bunch of walls and say, that's it, we're not letting anybody else in and we can't do that. So I, I'd be with, with Councillor Bruce on this one, not in terms of developing the plan, but in terms of acknowledging that, you know what, there may be a need for that and, and building that into the possibilities for the future, if, if nothing else, at least notionally. So that's, that's my thinking on the bypass. The, the original reason I put up my hand for round two was just to some of the comments we heard around the, uh, the, uh, the rail corridor. And I'm not sure whether everybody here is familiar, and I'm not sure whether the consultants or, or staff are familiar, but there was a court ruling for the BC Court of Appeal last week uh, touching on a challenge from the Stanawas First Nation up in the Noose, which basically said um, the federal government who's been lagging in terms of the funding here, the province has committed if the feds commit, the federal government has 18 months to either commit to funding or this thing goes back to court and it's another mess. So uh, I would really strongly urge us not to make any um, snap decisions on the use of the, the corridor foundation lands until that issue is settled because if the feds come up with the money, and I'm, you know, on my other screen, I'm watching the election and it looks like the Liberals have another minority. So thank you for the six week, $600 million campaign that didn't change anything, but that's beside the point. Um, there's been a lot of talk, I know federally about this. And I think this court ruling may uh, finally get the feds off dead center on it and maybe commit some money. So before we give up the corridor to some other transportation priority or initiative, uh, let's let's just hold our fire on that one until we see what happens as a result of that court ruling. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Is there any further questions? I just have one follow-up question, just in terms of that report that was done um, regarding the highway, because there were a number of different options and that was a very extensive process that was undergone. And uh, I would imagine that part of the work that you're both doing would include looking at that bottleneck to some degree. Is that correct? Yes, I see nodding. Yeah, okay. Um, and less from our perspective in Victoria. Less from your perspective? Or Victoria, from North Couchin, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Murphy, go ahead. Uh, to Mayor Staples, uh, so certainly we're absolutely aware of the importance of the, the highway corridor through the city, and in many ways it defines the city to a large extent, and uh, it's difficult to cross, and you know, in many ways splits the city into two portions, uh, and it's a, a significant challenge. The the challenge with that is it's also not within our jurisdiction as the city. And so we are quite dependent on uh, convincing and uh, cooperation from the ministry uh, for options and alternatives. So we've had some discussions. Uh, certainly, I think the path that our TMS will take will be to identify improvements that we would seek and that we would request. And the ultimate implementation of those options, uh, unfortunately, we will have uh, limited influence on and so may become an undertaking over time to try and influence the level of government that does have that ability to implement uh, some of those improvements. So. Uh, in many ways, similar to the discussion that has just been had about the, the railway corridor and, uh, and even a bypass. Ultimately, those aren't City of Duncan decisions um, and require other levels of government to, to be involved. And so 
we have to find that balance of proposing network improvements that we have control over and can make, and then network improvements that will require support from other levels of government that we can advocate for uh, going forward once the plan is crafted. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Murphy. Are there any other questions at this time? Seeing no hands up on our screen, I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Casey for his presentation. And again, thank Ms. King for your presentation. And we'll go into question period. So Ms. Shittick, was there any questions that came in on our end? Mayor Staples, I have absolutely no questions that have come in. Okay, and we have a question period as well. Um, over to you, Mayor Sebring. Thank you very much. And I would ask the same question to our Deputy Corporate Officer. Folks have an opportunity to email their questions to legislative services at northcottage.ca. That was on the agenda. Have we had any uh, questions, Ms. May? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, we have received no questions. All right, thank you very much. Mayor Staples. Mayor Staples. You're muted. Okay, I'm gonna Sorry, go I'm muted. No, I'm here. Sorry, I was talking. I just, you know, <laughs> pressed the wrong button too many times. Um, so on that note, yeah, I just would like to thank again our presenters and thank um, staff for organizing this meeting this evening. It's um, it's good for us to come together, particularly when we're working, you know, on plans in cities and communities that that connect. And I just want to acknowledge my appreciation of how much work staff and council do um, working together and collaborating on this and many other um, issues and, and concerns in our community. It's noticed and it's much appreciated on all fronts. And with that, I would call for a motion from uh, the Duncan Council to adjourn. All those in favor? Motion carries and over to you, Mayor Sebring. Thank you, Mayor Staples. And you said it so well, there's really no point repeating it, but I'm going to to some degree. Thank you to the consultants, to our staff, to your staff. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed this, this relationship that our two councils have. And certainly I, I watch it at the staff level and I'm sure you do too, Mayor Staples. And it's, it's good to see that that uh, interaction and it's more than cooperation. It's, it's more than working together. It's actually, uh, you know, working toward common goals and, and doing that with, with a shared understanding of who we are. So that's very much appreciated. And with that, I'd also like to call for a motion to adjourn from somebody on North Cowichan Council because we have a separate meeting underway. Councilor Sari moves, Councilor uh, Toporowski seconds, all in favor. And opposed, thank you. This meeting is adjourned at our end at 7.53 p.m. Thank you all very much. <laughs>